Good morning. Um, I'm Michelle Barnett, Senior Vice President of Economic and Workforce Development for the Tulsa Authority for Economic Opportunity. We are an authority of the city of Tulsa that supports large and small businesses as they look to grow and expand here in Tulsa. One of the things we're going to talk about today are city contracts, specifically engineering and construction contracts, and how your firm can leverage those contracts to grow your business and do business with the city of Tulsa. Just a little bit about how those work. We have both engineering prime contracts that do a lot of the work that you see around the city, um, whether it's a road construction project or utilities or water or sewer lines. Um, those are being done by our uh, prime contractors. And so when you see that word, a prime contractor is like a general contractor. Um, they are supported by small businesses throughout the community. And we have a requirement on our programs, on our construction contracts, that those projects have a 10% uh, contribution from local small businesses. So those uh, are everything from utility contractors to people who set out the road signs that tell traffic which way to go. Um, they could be hydrologists or engineers or architects that each contribute to that. So if you are interested in being a small business um, that is part of that 10% set aside, we have our small business enterprise program. Um, every year, they, those groups do substantial work throughout the city. And over the past five years, we've seen about $10.5 million in contracts go to our local small businesses uh, through the SBE program. Today, we're going to be talking more and listening to a couple of videos about how to put in uh, contracts and bills um, as a prime contractor, and then as well, how to put in letters of interest and statement of qualifications if you want to be a prime architecture or engineering contractor to the city. Again, both of those have small business requirements, and we'll address those in other videos this week. Um, but today we're going to talk about being a prime construction contractor or a prime architect or engineer and how to be successful in winning those projects. And so we'll go ahead and get started with our video now. And we're excited to have you here as part of the Global Entrepreneurship Week. Good morning. So we are doing the SBE training. Hopefully everyone can see the screen on this PowerPoint um, about engineering construction bid and project process. Uh, kind of breaking down the different steps as we're going along um, the program. So when it comes to engineering bid projects, these are listed actually on the website, which hopefully if this works, it'll open up the website for you guys. Bear with me. Um, try, the, try this a few times. So when you go to engineering's website, they have a construction bid what, uh, listing as you scroll down, they actually have all the bid opening dates. As you can see, these links will open up the proposals, the drawings, the specification books. It has a link to when the next meeting will be held, as well as if there's an SBE goal and a pre-qualification for those um, prime contractors. And towards the top, it talks a little bit more about the pre-qualifications and um, how you can get on the pre-qualification submit your application to the engineering department. Um, if you have any other questions on that, please let us know. If not, we'll go ahead and continue on. I'll go back to the slide here, Let's see if it'll go back. So as you can see, there are links to everything, addendas, revisions, spec books, the plans, uh, the goal, and then if there's any pre-qualification indicated for each of those projects. Basically did a screenshot in case that website was not going to work for us, which I'm glad it did. Okay, so the next step would be a pre-bid project meeting. As you can see on those virtual links, you would go to the link on the website of those projects that you're interested in. This is important because if you are an SBE contractor, you would like to participate in the project, please attend that meeting. Um, during that meeting, the engineers and architects discuss the project and the important dates of that project. They'll discuss if there's any addenda or revisions to that project. Um, all the attendees will share their information 
on the uh, right now their virtual meetings and that list is sent out to all the attendees and it's important to know that only qualified contractors who attend that pre-bid can submit a bid for that project as a prime contractor once that meeting is over that prime contractor will contact an SBE member uh, generally via email with any labor supplies they need and um, I believe Anika if I'm correct the prime contractors pull that information from that project spec book that correct engineering team yes that is correct okay thank you um, best practice is that SBE members respond to all requests uh, you send a quote to those labor supplies that you can um, participate in or you notify that you cannot fulfill the quote whether you're unavailable due to other jobs you picked up or that's just not within your work scope um, that prime will then um, Nika I apologize I think this is where we were kind of coming up with some issues right. here um, right. That's so I'm going to go ahead and skip I, because, okay. like I said, I apologize. I think I put these out of order. Um, the Prime will fill out an SBE solicitation form for every SBE member they contact, whether or not an SBE member is able to participate in that project. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and click on that form just so you guys can see the form that they will fill out based on the conversation they had with you guys or that they were not able to. So if you look at the top, it talks. They'll go ahead and list the project information. They'll talk about the um, subcontractor information about when they contacted you, uh, whether you're an SBE member, your SBE number, and your contact information description of work. As we go down here, um, if they are not able to um, work with you, they will put in a reason why whether you guys were unavailable or there just wasn't a response but that is required from the prime contractors to submit for every SV member they they reach out to whether or not you as SV member is a, are able to participate in that job that prime will also fill out the SB utilization form that is for every SB member that they were able to um, receive a quote for and able to work on that project so I'm going to go ahead and pull that file up as well here they'll put the project information they actually will list the SBE member company the type of work they're doing down here the projected dollars that they're going to do and the projected percentage based on the project totals and then they will go ahead and sign that and submit that with their paperwork And Anika, did you want to jump in about the letter of intent? Because like I said, I apologize, I put that out of order. Sure, um, thank you. This is Anika Ture, uh, Engineering Services Contract Administration. Um, the letter of intent is a document that basically confirms that the prime contractor and the subcontractor have an agreement of the amount solicited for um, prior to awarding the project. Um, it is the prime contractor's responsibility to make sure the letter of intent is submitted by the Thursday following the Friday's bid opening. So that would literally be four days, four working days after that Friday's bid opening, submitting that letter of intent. The subcontractor must sign off on that letter of intent. As I said, that is our confirmation that you two companies are in agreement of that dollar amount. I'm going to go ahead and pull that up. And like I said, I apologize. I've got them out of order here. Okay, so this is the form that Anika was talking about. The project information goes at the top. The prime contractor will fill it out with the SBE member, uh, talking about if they are an SBE member, the amount include the quote that was provided to them, and then both the prime contractor representative and the SBE representative will sign that form. Um, and again, that's um, 
you look at the bottom, if the form's not received, that proposed utilization will not be counted as part of the prime contractor's agreement, which is important when we have those 10% goals. We definitely want your business's um, work counted into that utilization for the project goal. Sorry, it scrolled forward here. Okay, when the project bid is awarded, Anika or Paul, if you guys would like to jump in and talk about um, that 10% utilization goal and the lowest bid um, and about how we get to that, um, that bid award. Anika, are you gonna take that or you want me to? Go ahead, Mr. Zachary. All right. Uh, this is Paul Zachram, the Director of Engineering Services. Um, the project bid, what we do is in the process of receiving the bid, we then have a meeting on the following Monday uh, that we evaluate and we list out all the solicitations uh, that were made to, de uh, to really define the good faith effort as it's described and defined in our bidding instructions. Uh, and if it meets the criteria that the uh, a good faith effort was made to meet that 10% SBE utilization goal. Uh, we move forward, and as a, uh, we have an internal group that uh, supports and looks at the data, and we'll either say we're going to make a recommendation for award of this uh, based upon the lowest responsible SBE uh, compliant contractor. One of the items that we do have in here, and is part of our program is we realize that there are some areas and some business categories and some special skill sets that in our marketplace, we cannot get 10% utilization. But what we have done is we've actually put that back into the contracting communities uh, arena in the fact that we may have some that across the board out of five bidders, we may have three, five, four, 6%, and what that gives us is an indication of that is what the market and what the availability and capability of our SBEs are. Um, so we do look at that. Our goal is 10%. And I will say that a lot of, a lot of our horizontal construction, uh, street construction, et cetera, we do have SBE firms that can provide and very rarely do we get below 10% unless there's a you know, specialty issue we're able to get that because we do have SBE firms out there that can provide the services required. So our 10% SBE utilization goal is, uh, it's aspirational and we realize that uh, it is maybe not available in all categories and we have the ability to just evaluate the good faith efforts. So those solicitation forms um, that uh, we talked about just earlier are very, very key uh, in the evaluation of the 10% goal. We are looking, you know, we focus and look at the 10% goal, but our main issue, was there a good faith effort and were they each one evaluated accordingly? So we take it uh, very seriously and we've had several uh, that we have deemed non-responsive due to a lack of good faith effort uh, in going through that. So it's very important in the instructions to please go through what is defined as a good faith effort. And if you have any questions about specifically, uh, you know, I, I called one person and, but then your competitors called two or three and they were able to get the 10%. The chances are, even if you're low bidder at the prime, they're not going to be able to. There's a whole lot more uh, to that and we can go more into that, but we do take the review of the side of services. Thanks, Paul. I appreciate it. I know it's there's different circumstances, so that's why I just kind of did a, a more of a generic that we do try to typically award to the lowest bidder. But like I said, like you said, there's different projects that may not be able to meet that 10%. So I appreciate that. I realized that I skipped over the affidavit. I'm going to go back one slide. Anika or Paul, could you explain um, about that affidavit right here? Um, that the prime contractor will submit with their bid package? Anika, why don't you cover that one? Got it. 
Okay, so this affidavit basically is what it states that this is um um it is in the um it is compliance that these documents are um are to be filled out and that um the prime has can, can you scroll down on that for me, Rachel, please? I was trying to see here. Yeah, so it's like any other affidavit. Um, it is basically what needs to be filled out by the prime, and that they are um, are basically in, uh, agreeing and complying to our um, instructions um, that are presented in our contract books or our bid books by submitting um, those documents that are requested. Um, the SBE page two, three, four, or five. Um, it, originally, it starts with this record solicitation, which is the SBE two page. So it's as any other affidavit. This is just saying that he's in compliance with what we're requesting for our SBE participation in our um, capital improvement projects. It is a must to be filled out. It is a must to be submitted with your bid book. Okay. Appreciate it. And if you see kind of the wor the wording, you know, Paul mentioned that that good faith effort, um, you know, that's important on there because we want that affidavit submitted with their bid package that they did make that good faith effort in their solicitation to those SBE members. So I appreciate that. Thank you, Anika. Okay, we're going to go over just briefly about change forms if they're applicable. I believe this should pull up a blank change form. Uh, this form is submitted um, if a project's scope of work changes, whether that increases or decreases the use of an SBE member. That prime will reach out to the SBE member. And, and here it uh, talks about that change in service to be performed and then the reason for the change, it's important that those prime members uh, explain why that change is being requested. Um, it is signed by the SBE and the prime contractor, but also has to be approved by the contract admin engineering services and someone in the SBE program before that prime member can actually get a new letter of intent and a record of solicitation for that SBE members change. Um, also, a SBE company may not be available once a project begins, so it is the prime's responsibility to locate another SBE member to fulfill that work, or they locate multiple members to maintain that original utilization goal, because again, that goal is at 10%, and that's still stressed throughout the program. Um, typically, if you've been able to look at our um, 2018 utilization report memo, most of our projects have actually increased from the 10%, and by the final um, payment, they went up maybe 10% to 14% or 10% to 12%. Um, but any changes, whether it's an increase or decrease, those prime contractors do have to submit these change request forms. May I add on to that, Rachel? Yeah. Also, with these change request forms, um, they are we first must be into an executed contract before any changes can take place and then we can move forward um our prime's responsibility as mentioned as rachel just mentioned is to um let the um the subcontractor know um of the changes if it's a decrease we will um, we ask for the subcontractor to sign off on this however um there has been a cases if a subcontractor, subcontractor can't be reached or may not be in agreement, we still have to proceed forward. But we ask our prime to submit documentation of the attempt to have the um, subcontractor to agree with the decrease, if that's the case. Um, we, will, we, we can go into that further as that situation arises. Um, just stay in contact with myself or um, an SBE officer to, well, if you have to, um, if we have to address that situation, but a change request can only be submitted once we are into an executed contract. Then we can go with some changes there. Okay. That's all I have, Rachel. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. Know that it's more in your wheelhouse since you are the one that also has to approve those. So. 
Okay, so once that project is completed, obviously the city will complete the project inspection. That prime contractor will submit all their final paperwork, including any change order forms, any updated letters of intent, and the final utilization form. And I apologize, I believe this final utilization form is from a project that actually finaled out. Um, I believe so. Um, if you can see on that project, there's the project information. It talks about there's the SBE members with the projected dollars, and then they did have some change forms, and so there's the actual dollars of that change. If you can see, it went from 14% to 18%, but the contractors have signed the projected, and then at the end of the project, they sign that final, and that is submitted with all their paperwork, and their invoices to have the request for that final payment. Um, just a reminder, when it comes to payments, the city pays a prime contractor. It is the prime contractor that pays that SBE contractor um, and not us directly. So. Uh, Rachel, can I jump in yeah. again? Yeah. Ryan, could you please explain, uh, Mr. Ryan McCaskill, if you're here, could you please explain um, to our participants of if any changes during construction are to be made, when those changes should be submitted? Uh, the, the changes should be uh, submitted with uh, each pay app or notification uh, as soon as you know that a change is going to occur. Um, if for some reason there is a uh, sub uh, that cannot uh, fulfill the job, if uh, they are busy or tied up on another job um, and the intent is to change, we need to get that change request notified uh, prior to uh, doing any of the work. Um, and then uh, update and notify a letter of intent uh, with each pay app. Thank you. So all that to be said, all that to be said, we're asking for these change request forms um, to be finalized prior to the final SBE utilization form. That's all I have, Rachel. Okay, thank you. Um, that's pretty much the end of our presentation. There are SBE contact information from our engineering services and for the Mayor's Office of Economic Development. Um, our email addresses are here. I believe we've also added them to the chat page as well. Um, does anyone have any questions from our participants today? Josh asked if we are offering a session like this for design. Um, someone in engineering services, would you guys be able to answer that? One of the things that's a little bit different for the design is with each of the um, contractors, in this case, be it an architect or an engineer, we get to negotiate. Those things are negotiated, and we pretty much just give an instruction that you're going to have those. Um, deal. So yes, each one of our, what I'm going to call a prime consultant, is given the instructions and they go over that and we're able to go back and forth. The issue with the bid or the instructions to bidders, the contractors are kind of on their own and then once they submit it, um, they can't, that can't change if that makes sense. Bid day, once our documents are submitted, and maybe this just needs to be a point. Once a bid is submitted, the prime contractor cannot change. Or once he sees that he's a low bid, uh, has submitted a low bid, then go back and chase and go get the SBEs. All these SBE documents and all those declarations of their use, they cannot be modified once they submit. So there's kind of a hard date, and they're kind of doing it on their own. It's, it's more of a their responsibility to go after it. So on the consultant side, if, and I'm just going to say for an example, if a designer comes back in and they come back in with two or three percent, 
I can tell you that every project manager in engineering services is going to send them back out and we're going to continue to go after it until we get 10 percent. There are situations where we cannot get to the 10 percent um, and this is a long answer to the question but basically we do one-on-one -on -one discussions with all our consultants. We go through this with every letters of interest statement of qualifications that we send out. We talk about the SBE utilization and the instructions if they fully understand it and uh, want to know their plan. Uh, and actually in the selection of the consultants, it's part of the criteria that we give points to is their understanding and their commitment to the SBE program. But as we negotiate each agreement with the consultants, it's a one-on-one -on -one type deal. So we don't have a broad training as much as like this because, but they do have the same forms. We have the solicitation forms, we have the change forms, all the forms are identical, but it really is more of a one-on-one -on -one, uh, type arrangement. And um, one of the items on there and Anik, uh, I don't know that it was, I did not see that in here. Um, we have what we call a TUL 9280 form for our design consultants, that's architects, engineers, planners, et cetera. We maintain that list and whenever we send out letters of interest, statement of qualifications, that goes out to everybody on that list. Even if we're doing vertical construction, say we're advertising for the design of a fire station, we still let all our civils know, we let every surveyor, every geotech, all disciplines, and you can be on that list for free, uh, that distribution. All you do is submit it and we will update it periodically, but that way you can be made aware when we're sending out a letter of interest, statement of qualifications, and requesting uh, professional services for those folks to submit their, their interest in being in that project. So it's been very good for us in that some of our the SBE designers, they're all aware when a project hits the street and then they can then go contact and be proactive in addressing the primes as well. So that is one way and we can have that on there. If you want to contact uh, Anika or myself, we can get you the website uh, for how to get the TUL 9280 form on the side of the professional services. And we would welcome having more folks on that list uh, as well. And it would be an advantage uh, from that standpoint is that you would know beforehand, before any consultant is selected to do work for the city, that you know that who all that might be that might be uh, looking for your services. So it would also provide a, a marketing and a network uh, opportunity for you. I appreciate that, Paul. We have another question from Katie said, all are all AE, RFPs, RFQs posted publicly? Yes. They're on our website. Okay. That's what I thought. Um, we have a, another message from Angela. What is the time frame from bid opening to confirmation of award or intent to award to prime contractor? Anika, are you going to do that one? Yes, sir. The intent from bid opening to award is 30 days. Um, the intent from award to executed contract is 30 to 60 days. We do our best to get those things um, 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 through the system uh, as far as writing for signatures and everything during that time frame. Um, may I make a side note, however, due to our, our coronavirus situation and working time frames and such, um, it's a little bit of a new time and different time, but that is our intent. We're working diligently to still stay within that time frame. Okay, are there any other questions? If you guys have any other questions, feel free to add to the chat. We'll keep that open for a few more minutes. And if you do have further questions, um, feel free to reach out to Anika if you have questions specifically about um, the process of the contracts, if you have a question about SBE program or uh, updates or um, when our next training event is, please reach out to the SBE at cityoftulsa.org. But we'll keep this open just for a few minutes if there's anyone else who wants to um, type in their question or they can unmute themselves and um, ask the question as well.
Paul or Anika, is there anything else you guys would like to add onto this presentation? We'll make a couple changes um, before we post the actual presentation up on the website. Um, but yeah, if you guys have any other um, thoughts or input you'd like to add into this, Paul or Anika, we'd appreciate it. This is Paul. I think um, we have been working very hard on getting this, uh, the SBE program, uh, working within the capital program, uh, the capital projects. Um, and we, we are greatly in need of getting more SBE folks and contractors across the board in all categories uh, onboarding. Um, as we get into our CM contracting opportunities, we're still doing the same uh, item. We have our, our primes or the CMs, and we, we want these subcontracting uh, done. It, it provides a lot of direct bidding uh, services as well as subcontracting type work. Um, we need to get the word out, and we need to grow our list. Um, that's, our, that's been our biggest challenge over the last couple of years is the lack of SBE participants in that way. I mean, right now to their good, um, it's very, it's, it's an isolated, they get a lot, a lot of work goes to several firms and there are some uh, top performers that get repeat business, but that comes from being in the marketplace or, and getting the prime contractors aware of your firm. Um, that is, it's, it should not be, this program is not just one where you sit and wait to be contacted by somebody, but with the, the way that Anika's got the, um, the pre-bids and the way we have them set up as mandatory, um, you're not having to try to contact 225 different contractors. For each project and every project, you have a narrowed list from five to six folks that may be plan holders, and it really makes it for direct marketing and direct uh, networking opportunities can be done through that. So please take advantage of following the, the pre-bid notifications, and, the, uh, and that will give you a very, you can reach out, and these folks need to get their 10%, so you can make that easier for them and if you make that easier for them, then your relationship gets built and the chances are that you can grow within the SBE program. So um, please do not wait to be contacted. Please be proactive about this. And if you do have other firms that you know of or firms that you work alongside with, uh, please encourage them if they are SBE capable and they meet the criteria, please encourage them to sign up and become a member of the SBE program. Appreciate that, Paul. And we have had a couple of people, I think, that joined that have not had a chance to add their information to the contact in the chat. Put your name, business name, and an email address. That way, if you have any questions, we can reach out to you. Uh, Angela had asked if there is someone with SBE. Yes, Angela, uh, if you see on our contacts, Clay Hulk and I are with the uh, Mayor's Office of Economic Development, and we are, he's managing, and I'm working on the administrative part of the SB program. We have Kendra Carter from Mayor's Office of Resilience and Equity. Uh, she is working with us on the SB program as well. So uh, I believe I sent a message to uh, Angela, if you will please have your, leave your email address and your phone number, and I will go ahead and reach out to you after the meeting and we can talk about the SBE application process. If anyone is interested, they're just welcome to go to our email. Our website is cityoftulsa.org slash SBE, and that'll talk of, that has our information about our program, our application details, talks about the utilization reports and the survey that Clay mentioned, as well as the current availability list that engineering provides us. So, uh, if you have any other questions, just feel free to reach out. Uh, but I appreciate you guys all for attending this meeting. And like I said, reach out to us via our emails. If you have any questions, thank you guys for joining us. We're glad to welcome you guys to this one of our series that we do. Um, we typically try to do these one a quarter where we do some type of training event um, related to growing your business. Um, last month we did, or yeah, it was last month or October, we did 
um, a workshop with the Oklahoma Department of Transportation about being a contractor uh, for ODOT. And this time we're doing one on preparing a winning S letter of interest in SOQ. And so we'll just get to that. Um, I can figure out in advance. Good. Um, today we have presenting myself, as I mentioned, and Henry, I'll let you introduce yourself. Sure, I'm Henry Somdesurf. I'm the design engineering manager, and my me and my staff handle the administration of capital projects. Very good. So Henry's going to be talking to us here in just a minute. Um, I did just want to clarify what we're talking about today. We're really looking at letters of interest and statements of qualification that are required for bidding on City of Tulsa contracts. Uh, these are professional, the topic is really professional services contracts that require a qualifications-based selection. That's something the state sets up and says that those types of contracts have a certain, certain way that you're going to do selections. Um, and so we do that through this letter of interest statement of qualifications. The type of things that we consider or do contracting for professional services in are typically survey, geotech, architecture, et cetera, that are listed there. Um, and so in preparing this, we really thought about a, a few different types of groups that might be interested, um, whether you're an existing prime that wants to increase um, your win rate, or if you're a new prime, somebody who's new to working with the city of Tulsa and wants to understand how to get involved in our contracting for professional services, or maybe you're a small business participant who's looking to grow and start doing prime contracts, um, or whatever else you're, you come to us as. Um, we're excited to have you here and looking forward to talking with everyone today. And I'm gonna turn this over to Henry next to really talk about the process of letters of interest and statements of qualifications and how that happens. Great, thank you. All right, to dive in, if you're not currently a, on our 2L9280 list, the first step is to obtain the form and submit it to Ms. Angie Toon, and she'll put it in our database, and that's the base, basis for our mailings for future LOISOQs. And if you want to verify if you're currently on the list or you want to verify the validity of your existing information, you can ask, just email Angie and ask her, or you can call her at 918-596-7355, and she can verify the correctness of your information. And on the form in box number six, there is a space to list contact information for two primes. In in that box as well, if you could add two email addresses, we're trying to add email addresses as additional contact um, methods for future LOS or Q mail outs. So in terms of process, get the information to Angie, she'll put it in the database, and then for all future mailings, whether it's architectural, engineering, landscape architecture, survey, whatever it is, we mail out all these solicitations to all 233 listed firms in the database. What's the next slide? Okay, and basically whenever we send out a letter, there is a brief description of the project, and then below that there's a listing of the characteristics of the project and then the scoring criteria, which I think Michelle is going to elaborate on in some of the following slides. So in terms of process, we'd send out the LOISOQ. The responses are hard copies. And again, I think the following slides have details on that. And once that's submitted, it goes to the, the five PCSSE members. And then if there is an involved department, like if we're designing a fire station, the, the response packets go to the members from the fire department and they score the responses as well. And then the scores are combined. And then at a PCSSE meeting, the scores are evaluated. And based upon the scoring, we either do a direct selection, we might ask for additional information from a short list, we might do interviews. So those are the, the three options. And then whichever it is, the ultimate resolution is the PCSSC makes a recommendation to the mayor for the selection, or if it's a water and sewer project, the recommendation goes to the TMUA board. Hey, 
speaker Henry. Thanks you so thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, yeah, really appreciate it. Um and I have to admit, I can't see the chats as they come in. So Rachel, if you could just be looking at the chats and if there's something that we need to you know, address as we go through, uh, feel free to bring that up. Uh, I did just wanna mention, we have, I have a guy in my office who says he's not an engineer, he's not an architect, he's not a surveyor, he's not anything like that. But he says to me, every time we look at a proposal or an LOI, SOQ, that he can pick the winner simply by looking at the front cover. And I, for a long time, thought he was full of it because that's, you know, him, um, but that's fine. But it turn, turns out he's actually very accurate about these things. And so I had to kind of ask him, like, what it, what is it about just looking at the front cover that tells you who's gonna be the best or the most qualified? Um, so here, I'll ask you guys, you know, which one of these, just based on the cover, do you believe will have the best LOI SOQ once you get done? And Michelle, you can you can open up your phones if you want. Michelle, real quick, can you hit yeah. your slide option so it can kind of enlarge this the slides itself for the screen? Or the, oh, the one that looks like the little uh, the fourth icon on the bottom? Yes. I see that, but when I was doing this early it, earlier it kept crashing oh, when I okay. did that. So I'm I'm trying to keep it from crashing while I'm okay. doing this. Got it. Intentionally, if that's at all possible. Okay. Um, don't ask me, I'm having a computer day. Um, but yeah, willing to get your guys' feedback just based on these covers that are here. These are ones I made up out of nothing, so. Dun, dun, dun. Okay, well, if nobody wants to pipe in with their particular selection here, um, a. a a is there's a vote for a good for you um it is interesting just looking at and this is kind of the range of things that we get the cover is not included in your 10 page limit um you do have 10 pages to respond to the rfp um and some people don't put a cover on they just put their letter and go from there some people put a cover on but basically my colleague his, his theory is that if you have a proposal and you've taken the time to put a cover together that shows pictures and communicates that you actually understand the project, um, then you'll probably do a good job on the stuff on the inside too. Um, and I, I tend to think, okay, after we've gone through this a few times, he, he tends to be right about that. Now, if we were doing a proposal for um, city streets and your pictures all showed highway cloverleaf intersections, then that would probably be like, and eh, they don't really get it. Um, which is not to say anybody judges a book, judges a book by its cover, but um, it really does show the level of effort that you guys have put into the proposal overall when you do put a good cover on it. So leave that there for consideration. Um, I do want to get into the elements of the LOI SOQ, as Henry mentioned. Um, each of these elements, and they're pretty consistent across every request. So every request letter um, that goes out, and again, they're in hard copy, they're not emailed, so do be watching your mail. Um, they do come in hard copy, so it's always important to be checking those things, um, even though we do a lot of stuff online these days. Um, the typical things that are in every request for an LOI SOQ are listed here. The team experience, Description of the team member projects with verifiable verifiable references, the team organization and resumes, the current city of Tulsa agreements, the percentage of the work to be performed within the Tulsa MSA, what your SBE utilization will be, that's your small business enterprise utilization, and your TUL 9280 form. As I mentioned, this middle is 10 single-sided pages. It's pretty much every request is gonna have the same type of language. It typical, typically will request 15 hard copies to be delivered in one package to engineering services. And typically it's gonna to go to room S200, which is um, where the, the department head sits. Um, but that information will be in the request for the LOI SOQ. The letter itself is typically pretty short. It's one or two pages tops. Um, but pretty much always with the same information in it. 
So let's talk about each of these elements and how we can improve our, our responses this way. So the initial question is always about the team experience. And that gets to how this team has worked together in the past and not just the team that you have in-house, but also your subcontractors that you're going to be working with. Um, it want, really wants to get to your capacity and your capabilities. Uh, what else can you also do besides the scope of work that's been requested? If something weird comes up or out of the ordinary or unexpected, are there other related services that you can be offering um, or offer through your subcontractors to help address you know, those types of contingencies? I will note that the request for letter of interest in SOQ, as you may have noted when I listed out the, the criteria there, did not have anything about it, about your methodology or your approach. It's not asking how are you going to do this or such. Um, but this is a good place for you to demonstrate that you really do understand how to do the project and how to complete the work that's been asked for. So, this could be done through um, doing a deep dive on a similar project and taking this time to explain in depth about a similar project that you've done, especially one that you and your subcontractors have done together would be even better, um, and kind of get into more details than you might have um, on the following sections. Typically, this section is worth 20 to 30 points out of the total. Every proposal gets 100 points that are broken down. So this section and the one following um, make up a lot of the points that are awarded. I will also mention that in the request for LOI SOQ, um, it'll list out each of those criteria, the team experience, et cetera, resumes, et cetera, and it will assign and indicate in the letter itself how many points are available inside that category or from that category. So the rubric for the evaluation is built into the request letter itself. So do make sure that you take the time to read not just the criteria, but how much those are each worth. Um, those are typically pretty consistent from request to request, um, but you do wanna just make sure that you haven't missed something there. So the next section that we get to are after the team experience, the next one that we look at is the team member project with references. Typically, we'll ask for between three and five projects with references. Again, always make sure that your references know that you're using them for references before you put them in. Um, it's never a good idea to, it's never fun when people call your reference and they're like, I don't remember that project or, I'm not sure that I want to talk about that. Those are not the responses that you want to get. So even if it's just a short email saying, hey, Jolene, I really liked working with you. Wanted to know if you'd be okay if we used you for a reference on this project that we're looking to apply for. Um, and just get a quick email back from them. That's great. Um, but I, I have seen people who don't get references confirmed and then it can bite them in the end. Um, so I just want to go over real quickly the types of responses that we see um, when we do ask for team member projects with references. Um, the best type of project that you can include here are the people that are on your team inside your company and the same project manager and the same subcontractors have all done this type of project together before. Um, that doesn't always happen, but it is really nice when you can say, this folks and this lead and these subs have all done this exact thing pretty much before with this other municipality or something. Um, you know, and the next kind of layer that we see is that this team at our company has completed this type project um, with this team, but we've got a new PM this time or we might have some different subs um, and that type of thing. And that's okay too, that's a, that's a good project. Um, next would be kind of on the list of 
best to, to least preferable would be this project has complete, I mean, this internal team, our staff, our staff here at our company have completed this project type before. Um, and then another way, to, another thing that we see is individual team members have completed this project type before, um, but they weren't working for us at the time. So we've done a good job of recruiting great engineers or architects or surveyors or whatever um, but we've never actually done this as a company previously, but these individual team members have done great work at other places. Um, and so you see that kind of going on down. You can see also, we see examples where a company has been a prime before for some type of project, but not with this team or not with this type of project. Um, so that would be more like we've been a prime and we did a water line before, but we really want to do pumped sewer lines at this time. Um, it would be a different project. And then we've subcontracted on projects before, but not with this team or this type of project. And then the, really the last of these is we don't have any direct previous experience, but we would really like the opportunity to bid on or to propose in this. Um, so really think about where your projects are at on this continuum. Um, are you, if you can like check all the boxes and find projects that represent um, things toward the top half of that list, those are gonna be better for you in terms of your score than towards the bottom of that list. Um, so do think about if there are, if, you, if your company has not done this type of work before, um, are there subcontractors that you could bring in um, or recruiting that you, need, you can do to have this project type in your resume? Um, or if you really haven't done this type of work before, and we'll talk about this later, um, are there ways that you can start as a subcontractor on the type of work that you want to be doing and then build up from there? So we'll go on to the next category. So we've covered our project team experience and then our individual projects that we want to use with references. And so I want to talk about this just a little more. Um, again, the LOIS IQ doesn't ask for methodology or approach, but your um, project examples and your project or your team experience will use these um, as an opportunity to demonstrate that you really do know how to do this work and how to make it happen. And so even when you say that we know how to do this work, there are a lot of different ways to say, we know how to do this. Um, and so I've included a couple here just as examples. Um, one of them is pretty straightforward. Our engineering company completed a structural analysis of this dam for this city. And that pretty much sets it out there as you know we've actually done this before somewhere. Um, but what we're looking for or what you might want to look for if you're looking to improve your scores on this is being really specific um, to explain how that your team completed that work. So here as an example, we see that our engineering company, our PM, and our project lead have done this type of work and they use this type of analysis to do this dam. To look at this type of dam and oh by the way this dam is a concrete gravity dam it's the same thing as you want us to do for your for your town um, this is how we did it we looked at these primary forces and secondary forces um, and we came up with a factor of safety and you know these were the impacts to the community about how they were able to I don't know get a higher rating and lower insurance values or something like that um, but anytime that you can be specific and then also reference the impacts to the, your customer and how your work benefited them um, are always going to explain your case much better. Um, so do think about, and I honestly, I've, I've read a lot of these and I we do see those examples where, um, you know, you do just see people say, we did this for this sitting which is fine, but it doesn't really explain that you, your company really understands how to do the work 
how you would do the work and what the benefits are to us in choosing your firm. So just things to, to think about there. Okay. So let's look at the next category here. And that is our team organization and resumes. And so when it refers to team organization, it really is the team organization. Um, I've seen a lot of proposals that are like, we are a multinational company based in Sydney, Australia, and this is our president, our VPs, and all of our VPs. And then there's another layer and another layer, and here's North America, and like six layers down is, you know, our local project office or something. Um, that's really not what we're looking for. Um, we're really not looking to know if you're a C Corp or an S Corp or this is your company history and you're founded in 1929. And um, although that's really neat, unless it's really relevant to the project, you've got 10 single-sided pages to work with. And that, that really makes it so that you need to make every word count um, of your proposal. So typically that means you're going to have a project org chart. Um, that's going to be, you know, if you have a project sponsor, if you have a project manager, who your leads are, who's going to be responsible for doing the work, who's going to be your QA person. Um, how do your subcontractors fit into that, into that organization as well? Um, you should also include resumes that should actually be in the text of your proposal or your LOI SOQ and not like attached as an appendix. Those resumes need to be included in that 10 pages. Um, so these are typically like a one paragraph about each person, unless they're like really, really important to your project. You might have a couple of paragraphs about that person. And so I've got a couple of examples here just about using all of the words that you have available um, to really tell the story of what sets your company and your people apart. You can see here just the first example, Julian Mavis has served as a project lead for similar projects. He has a bachelor's of engineering degree from Barquette College and an MS instructional engineer from the U University of Arkansas. So that provides the basics that, okay, this person at least has the basic information or basic background that we need to do the work. Um, the second example provides a lot more information. Jillian Mavis has served as a project lead for dam analysis on seven, seven similar concrete gravity dam projects in the last five years. Um, these projects leverage his training and structural engineering, as referenced there, as well as experience conducting forensic post-failure evaluations for FEMA. Now, I just made these up, um, but they should give you some example of like the way that you can use every word to really bolster the fact that you have the best people to do this job. Um, and this is why you should be selected. And every word is really important when you have a short amount of space to work in. Okay, so let's look at the next topic that's in there. Hold on. Um, the next one we have is current city of Tulsa contracts. And this is pretty straightforward. We just want a listing of current city of Tulsa contracts, both those that are ongoing and those that are in negotiation. Um, it can be helpful to demonstrate your um, capacity to do the work. If you have a contract that will be expiring soon, um, let's say, your folks have been working on this contract, but hey, it's gonna expire in January and we are really gonna be set to take on new work at that point in time and really look forward to doing this work, continuing this type of work with the city of Tulsa. Um, that's one example of the way that you can kind of phrase that information. Um, will this may also make more of your staff available? You know, if, if the people reviewing it know that your staff have been working on an existing project 75% of their time. Um, they might think about somebody else who has less work going on and more capacity. So use this to demonstrate not only what you're doing, but that you have experience working with the city of Tulsa, but also that you have the manpower to complete the work and when you're going to have the manpower to complete the work. Uh, the second, the next category there is the percentage of work to be performed in the Tulsa MSA. And we'll just remind everybody that MSA is Greek, Omogi, 
Osage, Pawnee, Rogers, Tulsa, and Wagner counties. Um, we'll want to just round that up to, to a whole number. Some people like to put in 2.654%. Um, just, you know, find a good number and put it in there, and that's really helpful. Um, we really do want to see that, you know, the city of Tulsa, our, our, our work is really going to be leveraged to help build Tulsa businesses or, or our regional businesses even in our MSA. And so this is one of the, the things that we ask about there. And then um, we get to our small business utilization. Um, if you're familiar with our small business enterprise program, I've included a link there to the businesses that are um, enrolled in our SBE program, that's our small business enterprise program. Um, I do wanna be clear that our small business program is not a small business administration program, it's different than that, it's a local program. And the link there will provide you information about um, the participants in that. I think right now we have about 130 different firms who are inside that, um, that range from, um, people who do a lot of construction to surveyors and everything in between. Um, so really take a good look at that. For specific projects, it's helpful to put the name of the company, their role and what dollar value that they're estimate that they're gonna be doing, and then including a short resume for each company. Um, for on-call contracts, if you're gonna be doing a survey contract or a geotech contract or something like that, where it might be done over the next three years and you really don't know what you're gonna be called on to do yet. Um, still include the name of the company that you are proposing to be working with, um, the role that they're gonna have there in their resume. Um, so an example here, and I really do see this on a regular basis um, that people just put in there, well, SBE program unit participants will be identified as needed. That's not an answer. Um, <clears throat> really do want to see some specific information here. So if it's an on-call contract, it might be phrased like based on the project scope, our engineering company will utilize the following SB's participants to reach our 10% contracting goal, and that's what you're going for, at least 10%. So company X is gonna do this, company Y is gonna do this, company what Z is gonna do this, and so forth. And then provide a short resume, if you have space for it, for each of these firms, especially if you've done work with them before. So we have worked with Williams Survey on these other two City of Tulsa projects before. Um, or we regularly use Cortex Labs for materials testing and you know they have these awards for doing this work. Um, or this is the ways that they've been recognized. So. Having that out there really helps demonstrate that you've taken the time to understand these firms, um, that they are good quality partners, they do really fit with the scope of work that's being proposed, um, and that you really have a plan to reaching that 10% goal. It's not fun to have to come back on the backside and be like, we're two years in and we don't know how we're gonna get to that 10% goal. Have a plan ahead of time about how you're going to use small businesses to reach your 10% goal, and then follow through with that. Okay. And then the final thing is the form TUL 9280 that goes, is attached to the, to the LOI SQ. Okay. This, um, this is what you submitted initially to get on the list to be considered. Um, we also want a copy of this to be included with your LOI. So cute. it's not part of the 10 pages, it's separate from that. Um, but hopefully you'll have in here projects that are specific to this pr proposal. So whereas you might have to enter the program provided a 9280 that is, um, says these are all of the things that our company can do. And here are all our projects to demonstrate that. You might update that at this point to say, okay, now that we're proposing on this particular project and this particular scope of work, these are the projects that we've done that are relevant to this particular request. So hopefully that makes sense. And then just some tips for getting started. 
I'll add here. Um, I do get a lot of requests from people who are maybe new to the area um, who call and say we have a you know, we have an office in Kansas City or we have an office in Wichita or whatever and we are interested in doing work in Tulsa. Um, there are a few tips I would give them for just getting started and I always do one, get registered, get your form 9280 in, be registered as a vendor, um, start getting those requests in the door. And then beyond that, um, be willing to start small. I think Henry usually tells people that the initial waterline design project, if you're looking to, to start doing them, is a two inch line. And that's sometimes hard for especially larger companies to hear because they may be doing ginormous projects, but um, really to make sure that we understand what your capabilities and capacity are, um, you'll probably start out small on a design project. Um, so that's just something to consider. Another way to get in the door is um, to be a subcontractor. Even if your company is usually a prime, one of the ways to start developing your resume um, in Tulsa or with any client for that matter um, is to demonstrate your capability in one area and then grow from that. So use your ability to be a subcontractor, uh, especially if you're in a new environment, a new community or a new customer that, you're, that you would like to work for. Same goes for Oklahoma Department of Transportation and others too. If you wanna get in, you really need to start as a sub and then work your way up from there um, to get your foot in the door. Third thing I would say is to go ahead and build relationships. It's, it's hard sometimes to make the decision to award projects to people if you really don't know who they are. Um, so do go ahead and start making relationships with people in public works and engineering services, um, folks like Henry who oversee design contracts, um, but also with your subcontractors and SBEs that you want to use. And so you feel comfortable with them when it's time to make those recommendations and use them in your projects. And then um, another way to get in the door is also to look at projects that reflect your company's truly unique capabilities. Um, and so I'll just say this is when I was doing engineering work and um, this is what what I would do is we would look for the truly weird projects that there were probably you know maybe three or four people in the US that could do um, and and go find those and so for you know the city of Tulsa we initially proposed on doing um, dam overturning analysis and that was that was really a project that we we did um, a long time ago but i think probably the city is still working with that same group of people to this day even though it's probably been 10 years um what is it that your company does that really is very unique and use that to get yourself in the door whether it's engineering or specialty services or inspections um, do, do your homework and figure out when those really oddball things are gonna be coming out. And then use that to your advantage in preparing your proposal and demonstrating that you really are the only people in this area that can do that work um, and get selected there. And so I will conclude there. Um, really wanted to leave some time here. Um, we did about 30 minutes of present presenting, but really I think the goal is to to hear from you guys and what you see or what questions that you have um, about growing your business with City of Tulsa contracts. And so i um, like to be able to open it up at this point in time. And Rachel, if you could take me off of presenter mode that would be great because I don't see that button anymore. Yep, I'll get right on that. Also, for those who joined a, a few minutes after Michelle started the presentation, this um, has been recorded. So um, I believe at the end of this week, I will um, be uploading that to our SBE's website. Um, that is just cityoftulsa.org forward slash SBE is in small business enterprise. So look for that later this week or Monday. So let me go ahead and get that off for Michelle. I think you should be good to go. Um, yeah. I think I have to go. Um, yeah. 
So I'll open it up to questions, or I see Henry, or I saw Paul come in here shortly, just a little while ago. If you guys would like to add anything uh, to that, I'd be glad to, to hear from you guys. I would add that in terms of subcontracting opportunities, one of the reasons we do mail out all the LOISOQs to all 233 firms on the list is if you are a potential sub, then you have awareness of all the opportunities regardless of what the disciplines are, so you can leverage that information as well. Thanks, Henry. I appreciate it. Very good. Are there any questions out there or comments or thoughts? And if not, I'll assume you guys have got this and you're you're all on board. Okay, if there are no brave souls who want to who want to speak, then I will just go ahead and we'll close it out and um, let you guys have some more of your time back this afternoon. But do thank you very much for tuning in today. Um, as Rachel mentioned, we will have this available probably here next week um, online if you came in late and would like to watch it from the beginning. Or if you have questions about the material that's been presented, feel free to contact us. Um, Henry's there, um, my email, mbarnett at cityoftulsa.org, and we'd be glad to, to help you with whatever your questions are. And with that, thank you guys for tuning in, and hopefully we'll, we'll have another one of these here next quarter, and be glad to have everyone back with us again. I just want to tell you a little bit more about our contracting for prime contractors as well as small businesses. Um, small businesses, if you're interested in being a part of the Small Business Enterprise or SBE program, uh, go on our website and check that out. We have a short survey at the top of our page uh, that you can fill in pretty quickly. It takes less than a minute to see if you're eligible to be part of the SBE program. That's at www.cityoftulsa.org forward slash economic development and check that out. Look for our Small Business Enterprise program. If you're interested in additional information about being a prime contractor to the city for either construction or professional services, engineering, architecture services, um, go online and see cityoftulsa.org and look for doing business with the city and bidding opportunities. And you'll see links to both the registration for each of those, as well as available contracts that are coming up right now. We're looking forward to working with you and seeing more businesses grow here in Tulsa.